pieces of evidence that you were shown was a scale that was prepared by which of may I approach judge a sketch of it's a composite the states exhibit 139 I apologize for the jury you remember this correct yes detective Pasquale Pasquale I apologize I'm going to put it on the board alright so here we go you want to set up and so this is, in essence, how you have documented where the evidentiary pieces were collected in the kitchen area, correct? Yes. All right. Now, I want to direct your attention. I want to make sure that everyone understands this. This is not the scale, correct? Correct. Right. But we do know the exact measurements of the kitchen. Do you agree with me? Yes. Okay. And I, 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 am I correct in that it would be five and a half feet uh, in a north-south direction and three and a half feet in a... Well, five and a half feet from here to here, and three and a half feet from here to here. It's just approximate. Okay. Well, it's it's actually specified in the report. Is it an approximation or the exact uh, uh, measurement? It's just approximate. Okay. Well, luckily, I have a rule. Taylor, come on up. With respect to if I can have him measure out of five and a half feet. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Using this black mark, this black... Uh, Okay, let's start Taylor. Go ahead and go five and a half feet. Just make sure that he does five and a half feet. That's one. And you can see who was incorrect the run about. So that's one. There's two feet. Here comes three feet. There's four feet. Sort of five feet. And let's go up six inches. Okay, and Tara, why don't you just mark it at where six inches is on the left side, on the other side? There you go. And let's remove the other six. So, the 
Would you agree that you now watch uh, one, of, one of our members of our team, Mr. Mr. Wasser, go from the black market tape here to where the uh, sticky pad there, and that's five and a half, correct? Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if anybody in the back row needs to stand up to be able to look at the floor, please don't hesitate to do so. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, you just give the jurors one moment just to position themselves as they wish. Sure. So, from here to roughly where the paint sticky is, is five and a half, correct? Yeah. Taylor, go from the, the corner of that table with the ruler, go over three and a half. Make sure, let's start from here. Let's start from the edge of the table right here, okay? No problem. Go ahead and do one foot. Two foot. Let's go to three feet. And let's go six feet. Approximately here is the width of the kitchen, correct? Okay, and moving up a little bit, let's see if we can keep this straight and go over here. So, from the black tape down here, walking into the kitchen is, in essence, this area, correct? And I'm, okay. So, why don't you stand? Right there, okay? On the other side, can you remember, okay? So you're now rested against the farthest area that you can do on the kitchen, correct? Okay. And I'm right here, correct? Okay. And this is me at the, the, the next, the, the barrier of walking into the kitchen. Does that sound about right? The doorway? Correct, okay. right? Now, Not going to use. I'm not going to use the actual firearm. But you 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 testify in your direct examination that a casing can travel three to five feet. Is that correct? Right. So if I'm at the entrance of coming into the kitchen and I go like this and I shoot you, would it be fair that the casing could travel anywhere inside that kitchen based on your testimony in these dimensions? Yes. You go ahead and take a seat. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Detective, you're aware that there was surveillance that memorialized prior to that morning in the house, right? Yes. And you'll agree with me. Have you seen the surveillance? Yes, I have. Did you watch the entire from the night before to the morning of, or did you just watch the event that, that led to the, to the responder transplant? Just That's the actual response. Okay. Were you given the opportunity to view the entire video of the night before? Did you ask for it? Did Detective Grossman at any point, <clears throat> at any point indicate this thing? Were you aware that the victim came up and down the stairs multiple times? That night, no. Were you aware that the victim on the morning of entered the kitchen and went into the first cabinet to your left and, and took something out of there? Were you aware of that? No, I was not. If you were aware of it, would you have looked to see what's inside that cabinet? Sure. We would have looked in there anyway. Did you look in there? We opened up things looking for weapons. Would you consider this to be a dangerous weapon? For the record, what is counsel holding? I apologize. I'm holding what has been marked as Government's Exhibit 143. Thank you. Is this a dangerous weapon? 
Are you asking me? Yes. yes. <laughs> you're the only person I'm Well, you're the one that I know I'm looking at, but you're the one in the witness chair. So, all my. Is this a dangerous weapon? Yes, it is. It's not a small mic, right? No. Is this a dangerous weapon? Yes, it is. It's not a small mic, right? No. If. Now, I notice you indicated that there was a. There was something that you thought was on the ridge of the, the knife, and that's what drew your attention to this specific knife, yes? On the handle. On the handle? Yes, on the ridge of the handle. Oh, wonder, it's still there. Now, did you guys go through and examine every single knife in that drawer? I did, yes. Did you photograph every single knife in that drawer? No. Just an overall. And this is the only one you collected because you assumed that this was blood. And it looked like it was possibly blood. Who told you to come and pull a knife from the cabinet? I don't recall anybody told me to pull a knife from the cabinet. So why did you pull a knife from the cabinet? Because it was a homicide scene. We were looking at everything. It stood out. This stood out because it had this speck on it? Yes, it did. Let me do this. I don't want to. Can you step on down again, dear? That's the time. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't mean it. It's just the force of that. Go ahead and hold that for a second. And step into the box which we've outlined to be. And mind you, you're stepping at the farthest portion of where we are. Why don't you take one step closer? Okay. Now you'll agree that in this position, we're literally within two feet of one another, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Okay. Now don't do it. But if you extend your arm, would that knife come into potentially come into contact? Yes. How tall is Jennifer Alfonso? I don't know. Okay. Was she of extraordinary size? No. Was she of minimum size? Uh, de minimum size? Was she an average size? Kind of like yourself? Yes. Now, do me a favor and extend your arm out. Your right arm. Stand. Okay, why don't you go stand where you were at the... Why don't you stand at the farthest part? Okay? Extend your arm out. Hold, put the knife like that. Now put the knife up. Now take one step. One step. Towards you. If I was in the kitchen, would you agree with me that that knife could be in contact with Probably, yeah. Well, I'm saying, if I was walk if I was standing where I'm standing in front of you, would that knife be directly inside? If you were standing in front of me, yes. Okay. Now take a step back. Okay, be careful. And put the knife up. And would you agree that if you were at the farthest point of the room, and I was just entering the room, it's about a foot and a half of two feet with the knife fully extended. Correct? Yes. Okay. It's okay. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. You can sit down. Will you agree with me? Is there Sorry, any... can you please be careful? I Will you agree with me that there are multiple knives in the kitchen cabinet door? Yes, sir. And did you have any discussion with Detective Grossman with regards to what you found with the, with the knife, with what, with what appeared to be a speck of blood. I don't know if it was a detective grocery, but I did have a conversation with one of the people. And what did you tell them? That this had a possible blood on the knife. When you entered the incident location at 555-67th Avenue, 555-67th Avenue, was that with the with the uh, advent of the search warrant? Yes. And will you agree with me that you got there after my client had given a, a statement? I don't know when your client gave a statement. So nobody mentioned a statement to you at the scene? No. Do 
drawing your attention if you want to step down the window. Uh, if you want to step down again. Did you guys recover a projectile in the hallway? Okay. I'm sorry, Casey. Not, not right. Number one, and it was right there, correct? Was the casing that you found in the hallway? Yes. Did it appear to be different in any way, shape, or form than the other casings that you found in the area that we that we discussed? And who specifically picked up all the casings? I did. During the course of the investigation, um, I noticed that whenever we handle the evidence, we put on gloves. Yes. And was that something that's required when you're conducting your crime scene investigation? Yes. And at any point, if a, if a, a glove becomes damaged or exposed, what are you instructed to do? Okay, if there was a picture of somebody who was shown a picture You're the lead crime scene investigator in this case, correct? So if, if you're in a crime scene, hypothetically, and you see somebody that's photographing an item and, that, and they have a, a ripped glove, what would you instruct them to do? It would depend on where the rip is, if it was ripped in an area that would be in contact with where the evidence What happens if I saw it? How long have you been doing crime scene work as a detective? 11 years. Have you been trained in blood spatter analysis? No. Have you ever seen someone conducting blood spatter analysis? Yes. Have you ever seen or observed a uh, blood spatter analysis uh, tech or, or a crime scene analyst doing a blood spatter analysis utilize Luma? Yes. Is luminol only used when you believe that a uh, an area has been tampered? Uh, luminol is used in the absence of blood. If you can visually see the blood, you do not use luminol. If you cannot see blood and you suspect that at some point it may be cleaned up, you use luminol. What happens if it's on a dark surface that the blood could potentially be? If you cannot see blood and you suspect that at some point it may be cleaned up, what happens if it's on a dark surface that the blood could potentially match the, the surface? Would you use luminol then? Do you match the surface? <sighs> Let's say there's a dark surface. And you, if it's not visual, you, you'll agree with me that sometimes blood spatter is minimal, correct? Yes. Okay. And let's say there's a dark surface and you, had, you wanted to eliminate, to make sure that there's no blood on there, would you potentially use luminol? If it's a dark surface and you can see blood, I mean, even if you can't see the color of blood, not on an area that was contaminated with blood. I'm not talking about sitting blood. I'm talking about spot. Yeah, if you can see the blood, no matter how small, how minute the area is, you would not use blood. Did you guys conduct any kind of analysis or investigation with regards to uh, General Alfonso's fingernails? And it's like we. Does crime scene, are you guys the one that, that, that scrape underneath the fingernails to determine if there was any kind of struggle if there was potentially the DNA of somebody else underneath the fingernails? Do you guys do that? Sometimes we do it, sometimes we do it. In this case, did you do that? I don't recall if somebody did that on the scene. I did not do that. As the lead forensic examiner in this case, if someone had done that, would you have gotten a report and you privy to it? Yes. Did you get a report or are you privy to it? I don't recall seeing a report. So would it be fair to say that no one from the crime scene unit did that in this investigation? That I'm aware of that. In your report,
May I approach? You may. Do you recognize this photo? Um, no, I don't recognize it. Has that been removed? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Has that been removed? That's not.
Detective Pasquale collected the GSR tape. If I refer to my court, I can tell you if it was related to him. Please go ahead. From the victim. From the victim. And that was who? The detective Pasqua. Thank you. Give me one second, Judge. What? One last line of question. Uh, detective, with regards to the knife, did you guys, when you were analyzing the knife that you collected... One last line of question. Uh, detective, with regards to the knife... Did you guys, when you were analyzing the knife that you collected, did you, did you try to take off the handle to see if there's any forensic evidence inside the handle? No, we wouldn't do that. You, would, you wouldn't do that? Why is that? Because the knife is generally sealed. It's, it's a piece of metal that's adhered to the, to the handle itself. Well, let me ask this question. Did you try to take off the handle to see if there's any forensic evidence? No, I would do something like that if it's necessary. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Redirect. Objection, Judge. Once again, the witness testified that it would be a pinball. Legal ground. Speculation. 
Ma'am, only if you know. Do not guess or assume if you do not know. When they say, I do not know. The projectile from an up position would land on top of something, and the projectiles from a lower position would bang off of other items in this particular case. And again, if a shooter hypothetically standing in this kitchen had a gun aimed low and the casing ejected to the right, what would be the object immediately to the right of the firearm? Uh, depending on where you're standing, if you're standing in the doorway, it would be the refrigerator. And a little past the refrigerator, what's the next object? Cabinets. Okay, and after that? Cabinets with an, an L shape. This, you know, so the oven. Now, if, again, a shooter were standing with a firearm aimed lower than the kitchen cabinets. Judge, I'm going to object. This is beyond the scope of the cross. I didn't finish mine. <laughs> if, hypothetically, if a shooter were aimed with the firearm lower than the cabinet, if the casing ejected to the right and struck the cabinet, based on your experience, would that casing strike the cabinet with enough force to leave any sort of marks? Objection, once again, just speculation. Only if you know, ma'am, if you do not guess or assume. It's a possibility. Judge, we move to strike. That's a guess. Oh. Firearm. I also receive uh, footwear, iron impressions, and, and 
what were in Paris to compare to see if they were made by the same object. Um, I also do serial number restoration on firearms and distance determination on clothing and other objects. Have you received any specialized training for this present position other than the Bachelor's of Science in Tools? Yes, I have. Um, my training includes uh, in-house training. It's a structured training program uh, based on study, observation, experimentation, and supervised casework. Um, and that's the in-house training, uh, which revolves around uh, some of the topics that we started about the study are firearm safety, instrumentation, uh, the history of firearms design, modern firearm design, uh, the history of ammunition, uh, tool mark identification, footwear and tire impression examination, and zero mark restoration as well as distance determination. And in each of those topics, um, there are books to read, articles to read, presentations to present um, to my fellow coworkers as well as to other agencies, um, as well as uh, proficiency tests and accountancy. <coughs> Um, special training I received outside of the laboratory includes NIBIN training. This is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. This is a national database in which fire casings are entered into a computer database and they are compared to images that have been taken of other casings. Um, in addition, I also received uh, uh, training and pattern matching from the California Criminal Justice Institute, and specifically it's called uh, consecutive matching stria. It's a pattern matching technique in which you can actually, um, which coincides and supplements the current pattern matching methods, or I can actually count and specify how many lines are required to make an identification on tool marks and marks. Okay. Um, <laughs> and just technically, efficiency mm -hmm. tests you're talking about, you have all your tests? Yes, okay. I see them every year. And um, so that, that's the continuing educational obligation that you have to remain yes, doing the work you do. Okay. And have you testified providing an opinion in the field of firearms identification um, and to a mark um, in uh, courts in Dick County? Uh, yes, I have. In firearms identification, uh, in this implies that I'm testifying. So please explain very basically, how does a firearm operate? Uh, firearm, uh, specifically, we'll talk about um, a pistol. In a pistol, um, this is a combination of an action where a projectile is fired um, using the process of combustion. Now, how this works is a pistol comes with a magazine or <coughs> Inside this magazine, you load live cartridges, which is composed of a casing and a projectile with gunpowder inside. You load those um, cartridges into a magazine. That magazine is loaded into the grip or the handle of the pistol. And the slide is, rear, is moved back on the firearm. When it comes forward, it grips the cartridge from the magazine and loads it into the chamber of the firearm. Now the firearm is locked and loaded. At which point, you can pull the trigger, and a part of the firearm called the firing pin now strikes the primer, which is on the rear of the cartridge, causing a small explosion which causes a jet of flame to go into the gunpowder and ignite it, causing a very high explosion. And this causes the bullet to come, shooting out of the muzzle end of the bullet. At the same time, the same energy that's pushing that projectile out of the muzzle of the, of the firearm is pushing that casing rearward against the firearm, against the rear of the firearm, which causes the slide to be pulled back, extracting and ejecting the casing out of the firearm, and now when the slide comes forward on its own spring of tension, it strips another cartridge from the magazine, and the cartridges and the firearm is now ready to fire again. We used um, some terms that I want to sort of clarify a little bit. Um, a projectile and casing. Yes. Could you explain what those are? Um, a projectile is the, uh, what a lot of people consider is the bullet is actually a full live cartridge. And a live cartridge is composed of a bullet and a casing, and there's gunpowder inside. I actually have a demonstrative aid. May I use it? Judge Misha, use her demonstrative aid to explain to the jury. Stay in your proceedings, as you wish. Thank you. Please. Good moment. Well, Judge, respectfully, I haven't seen the demonstrative aid. Okay. If you may bring, uh, if you may not show it to the jury, but if you please allow this, uh, the state of defense would like to approach the witness to be able to observe the item. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Klein? Please. You were standing. Approach the jury. Please stand in front of the mayor. Please, you may step down. This is a very large, monthly aid of a lot. 
person pose of casing and the projectile. The bottom of the casing, the rear of the casing, is a soft metal surface called the primer. Inside this primer is a small explosive, what, which is closed upon impact. So impact by the fire and the fire. When that primer is ignited, it sends flames, which this part of which is casing is filled with junk powder. Of course, when junk powder is set on fire, it causes an explosion, especially because it's a tight fit. So there's an explosion that causes the projectile to come out and down the barrel of the firearm and the casing to push rear. So when I'm talking about a bullet or a projectile, I'm referring to this object here. And when I refer to the casing, I'm referring to this part of the charge here. And this is the part that comes, it gets projected from the firearm from the chamber portion. And this is the part that goes down the barrel of the firearm. Okay? Exhibit 141. 
look at this and tell us if we recognize states as it one forty one. Yes. Tell us how you recognize it. Um, packaging has my uh, my initials and badge number as well as the date and the case number, as well as the seal has my initials and badge number. Um, and when you received that firearm, is that how you received it? I received the firearm inside the box with a plastic strap around it um, to signify that it's safe. So very similar to this. It's got a lot of things. Okay. And can you tell us if the firearm that you're looking at now, if that's the same serial number as the firearm that you examined? Yes. 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 Yes.
So if it's in double action, it means you're not pulling the slide back. You're just using that extra pressure to fire the fire. Yes. Okay.